Hello, my name is Dr. Maggie Mustard, and I am an independent scholar, curator, and museum educator. In the following short lecture, I'm going to offer the story of curating an exhibition of the work of Japanese photographer Araki Nobuyoshi as a way for us to consider questions of gender, power, and curatorial ethics in contemporary global photography. The exhibition in question was titled The Incomplete Araki, Life, Sex, and Death in the Work of Nobuyoshi Araki, and was on view at New York City's Museum of Sex from February to October of 2018. The planning of the exhibition took place in much of the year prior, and as such coincided directly with the first major wave of the Me Too movement, where women across multiple professional and creative industries began to publicly demand accountability from men in positions of power for instances of past abuse, sexual assault, psychological manipulation, and other forms of mistreatment. This context mean, meant that the act of curating the show of the already controversial photography of Araki Nobuyoshi had to address not just the content of his photographs, but also, and perhaps most importantly, an increased understanding about the dynamics of power, gender, money, celebrity, and consent that underwrote the photographs themselves. Together, we will briefly study an overview of Araki's photography to get a sense of the themes and debates that have been major constants in his career. Then, through a more in-depth discussion of the exhibition planning, we will consider questions about institutional transparency, gender and power dynamics between photographers and models, and curatorial ethics in moments of cultural change. After watching this lecture, you will hopefully understand more about the complexities of consent and power in the historically male-dominated world of photography in Japan, and will be able to consider expanded networks of responsibility for how and why women are or are not made visible in photographic history and museum institutions. Araki Nobuyoshi first gained prominence in the Japanese photography scene for his 1971 photo book, Sentimental Journey, in which his confessional and autobiographical approach to photography documented his honeymoon with his new wife, Aoki Yoko. While Sentimental Journey was not his first photo book, its particular visual language and photographic philosophy would quickly come to serve as proof of Araki's unique vision, explicit, erotic, confessional, and intimate images presented with an unapologetic frankness. In the photo book's preface, Araki wrote, quote, my debut as a photographer coincides with the beginning of my own I novel, end quote. The I novel was an early 20th century literary genre in Japan in which novelists attempted to express a greater degree of realism and individuality by breaking down the, the boundaries of memoir and fiction. By applying these concepts to his photographic practice, Araki proceeded to carve out a unique space in the world of post-war Japanese photography, gaining a reputation for being a skilled practitioner with an obsessive eye for intimate moments. This confessional and candid approach to the emotional and physical spaces usually confined to the domestic or the deeply private extended out into the world of Japanese society, especially in Araki's documentation of an interest in sex, bodies, and intimacy. This friction between truth and reality came to be known as eye photography or shishashin in relationship to Araki's work. While this deliberately confused relationship between autobiographical and staged photography is most often at work in the images that appear as candid encounters, it also underwrites the photographs that appear at first glance to be highly staged studio, pro studio productions involving props, bondage, costumes, etc. Araki's approach to the eye photograph is, as the scholar Izawa Kotoro has argued, a very particular form of egoism quote, not the fixed absolute self found in the Western modernist tradition, but instead is an eye like a moving body that experiences creation and dissolution simultaneously, where the observer and the subject being observed are always changing place, end quote. Much of the early public response to Iraqi within Japan, however, cared little for the compelling idea that, autobio that autobiography and fiction could coexist in photography. Instead, the domestic reactions to Iraqi, especially in the 1980s and 1990s, veered between moral outrage and an increasing fascination with his so-called photo devil persona. 
Araki's explicit nude photographs, often of bound female women or of candid scenes from Tokyo sex clubs, earned him and his gallery collaborators monetary fines, arrests, and the confiscation of works on the grounds of violating Japan's obscenity law. At the same time, these brushes with legality fueled an aspect of his rapidly recognizable persona that would become Arakism, a personal and artistic brand founded on anti-establishment mischief and a bold embrace of sexuality. Araki's confrontational and explicit images of women entangled in knots of rope, known as kinbakugi in Japanese, are his most popular and his most controversial works. Some critics dismiss them as pornography and especially degrading to women, while others stress the model's consent and their statements of often feeling a sense of liberation working with Araki in this way. Still other opinions analyze Araki's work as satirical and political, where the women in bondage point to the constraints placed on women within post-war Japanese society. In the mid-1990s, as Araki became more well-known outside of Japan, curators and academics began to consider the role of Orientalism and exoticism in Araki's explosive global popularity. In particular, the curator and art historian Christian Kravagna has argued that Ar Araki's kinbakubi photography is particularly popular in the West precisely because it exploits outdated and racist Eurocentric notions about East Asian women, as he says, quote, obedient and erotic at the same time, end quote. Araki is therefore in many ways a definitive celebrity artist of the latter decades of the 20th century, in spite of or because of his controversial run-ins with moral authority and social mores, he, and along with his photography, his persona, and his brand, have ended up as one of the most defining global exports of Japan in the 1990s and early 2000s. His prolific output, comprising more than four decades of active photography and over 500 photo book publications, now easily circulates the globe in the forms of fine art, cheap magazines, and collaborations with couture fashion houses and streetwear brands alike. So when I was invited to consult on curating the Museum of Sex exhibition of Araki's work, I therefore had to consider not only the volume and content of Araki's career, but also this particular history of criticism and debate. This particular institution offered a unique opportunity to curate a show in which ideas about propriety, pornography, and audience were largely a non-issue. But at the same time, I was really wary of being involved in an exhibition that presented his work in a purely laudatory way hoping instead that there would be room for a full contextual framing of the various critical opinions, controversies, and voices involved in understanding his work throughout his long career. Being assured that this would be the museum's preferred approach as well, the curatorial team, the curatorial team approached the exhibition structure thematically rather than chronologically. We made the decision to open the exhibition with Iraqi's most visually confrontational and controversial work, precisely because these works, their, their visual language, and the debates that have surrounded them open up onto some of the most complex and urgent conversations generated by Iraqi's photography. We wanted visitors to feel introduced and educated through a series of crucial questions. Why was Iraqi's work controversial in Japan? What were the legal and social norms that his work pressed up against? Why was Iraqi controversial once his work began to gain popularity in Europe and America? And then how did the conversation change? What are the power dynamics at play in his artistic process? What do his models say about working with him? And what is the role of celebrity and artistic brand in these relationships? After negotiating Araki's photography within the context of these questions, the second floor of the exhibition opened up onto some of the most common subject themes in Araki's work, including his wife Yoko, the city of Tokyo, its nightlife underbelly, erotos, which is Araki's word for the combination of sex and death, etc. We visualized a historical context of sexuality and art in Japan through a section on erotic ukiyo-e woodblock prints and provided additional information about the history of kimbakubi while also examining more slippery concepts like Araki's quote-unquote sentimentality. This section of the exhibition also provided the opportunity for visitors to experience Araki's prolific output visually through the installation of over 450 photo books in the center of the gallery. Most importantly for today's lecture, the exhibition intersected with the rise of the Me Too movement twice over the course of its planning and exhibition run. 
The first incident began with an allegation from a woman who is preferred to remain anonymous when referred to publicly. And the second resulted from allegations made by Kaori, a former longtime model of Iraqis. In the first case, in the fall of 2017, I came upon the woman's allegations on her personal Facebook page through an online network of academics and professionals engaged with the Japanese photography scene. Because this occurred during the planning stages of the exhibition, especially with regards to planning the section that was already devoted to the photographer model relationship, I reached out directly to the woman to hear more of her story. The details of the allegation involved a commercial photo shoot that took place in the early 1990s when the woman was a young and relatively well-known fashion model who had been engaged for a photo shoot for a teen magazine. Araki was already signed on as the photographer and by this point was all deeply established in Japan for both his erotic and commercial photography. According to this woman's statement, the shoot was a straightforward, fully clothed commercial fashion shoot and yet, Araki ended up making her extremely uncomfortable with both his words and physical actions as the shoot wrapped up, and especially after it ended. She stated that when she raised her discomfort with her managers and members of the team associated with the magazine, she was told that there was no use in raising any kind of fuss against a photographer as famous as Araki. When I first approached museum leadership with this information, there was some sympathy, but also fairly unequivocal resistance to the idea of addressing these allegations in a way that put them front and center. It was stated that in no way could the exhibition be canceled, and substantial mention was made of the way in which Iraqi would react were we to reference these allegations. As this exhibition's chief curatorial advisor, I was then faced with the decision of either canceling my contract or staying and attempting to convince leadership that some form of best practice really did involve addressing these allegations within the context of the exhibition. I feared that if I left, the allegations would likely not be addressed in any capacity, and that it was doubtful that this woman's experience would ever be heard again in relationship to Iraqi's work. Following multiple conversations with the anonymous woman and with museum leadership, her allegations eventually featured as a central component of the wall text associated with the photographer model relationship section of the exhibition. Her comfort level dictated her anonymity and the level of detail she wished to, ha wished to have included in her statement about her experience. You can read the wall text here as I continue to speak, or you can pause the lecture here and read it at your own pace. Following the exhibition's opening, I was almost immediately approached by a formal, former model, Kaori, who worked with Araki for nearly a decade. She told me that she wanted to reach out because she had read several articles that mentioned how the exhibition addressed the complicated framework of the photographer model relationship in Araki's work, and also how it openly included the previously mentioned allegations. Contrary to the accepted narrative, Kaori told me she was not Araki's girlfriend, and they did not have a long-term consensual sexual or romantic relationship. She was also conflicted about the common use of the word muse to describe her role, which even this exhibition had included in its original wall text. She also stated that over the course of 10 years she worked with Iraqi, she had been subjected to inconsistent pay, a lack of firm contract, and no input with regards to her working conditions or the way in which her image and the image of her nude body especially was packaged, framed, or contextualized. She stated that when she began to raise concerns, she was bullied, manipulated, and dismissed by Iraqi or by members of his team. Because Iraqi expressed a wish for her story to be made public, and because I felt there was an obligation for the exhibition to address these new allegations, I once again brought this information to the attention of museum leadership. I proposed three options for curatorial changes. One, close the exhibition early. Two, add Kaori's statement to the exhibition and transparently rewrite, rewrite the wall text associated with the three photographs her, of her that were currently installed. Or three, organize programming that explicitly and transparently addressed Kaori's allegations, Me Too, and the power imbalances of the model photographer relationship, or indeed some combination of the last two options. In the end, museum leadership agreed to the second option, and we obtained permission from Kaori to work both the English and Japanese versions of her statement into the exhibition, as well as her sign off on the updated wall text that at the time was associated with the three photographs her, of her included in the exhibition. Because of the subsequent media attention that Kaori's statement drew once it was published online and integrated into the exhibition, Araki's team eventually contacted the museum 
asking for the three photographs of Kadi to be pulled from the show. When we asked for an additional statement so we could contextualize and transparently explain to the show's audience why the works had been pulled, we got no reply. In place of the three photographs, we installed an interactive tablet with both the Japanese and English versions of Kaori's statement and the wall text that you have just seen. Let's consider this Iraqi photograph together in the context of the photographer model relationship and what is or isn't visible in terms of power dynamics at play. This exhibition installation view highlights a work from Araki's 2007 Bokuju Kitan series and shows a bound female model dressed in a schoolgirl uniform and suspended in the air while Araki himself poses in the corner, camera in hand. Now knowing about the allegations against Iraqi and about the various debates around pornography, the exploitation of nude images of women, and the issues around Orientalism and sexuality, how would you write a wall text label for this image? How would you help the viewer to understand the different forms of power at play in the image itself, in the image's creation, and in the gallery space in which they are standing? Are there any additional objects or images you can imagine pairing with this photograph to help tell the story you want the viewer to know? Much of what transpired while curating this exhibition now feels like an imperfect institutional response, but these events did have a clear and galvanizing effect on the way in which Iraqi's work was discussed in the media. At least at the time, it felt difficult to imagine a subsequent major exhibition that could responsibly feature Iraqi's work without contending with the visibility of these allegations. Unfortunately, in the intervening years, the general response to a post-allegation understanding of Iraqi's work has not been especially encouraging. Major figures in Japanese photography circles did eventually begin to weigh in, almost exclusively, however, in defense of the value of Iraqi's photographic career. Izawa Kotoro, undoubtedly still one of the most respected authorities on Iraqi in Japan, published his thoughts online in both English and Japanese in an attempt to reconcile Araki's work with Kaori's allegations, but with the unfortunate result of instead rehearsing outdated notions of personal responsibility and sexist romantic ideas of the power of the male artistic process. Towards the end of Kaori's relationship with Araki, Izawa writes, quote, Araki continued to project his obsession with the harlot on Kaori, and Kaori began to develop a powerful sense of dislike and discomfort at being made to move and behave according to Iraqi's will, being treated like an object. If they had been able to sever their ties skillfully at that point, Kaori would doubtless not have struggled so much, but it was not to be. One can only imagine with regard to this that bo they both had a powerful attachment to taking photographs and being photographed." End quote. Izawa also returns to the concept of eye photography or shisha shin, this time not only as a way to justify Iraqi's significance, but also to muddy the waters in terms of authenticity, culpability, and personal agency. He says, the Iraqi style shisha shin was a show with an all-star cast performed by the Iraqi theater company, led by the character Araki. To stage such a show demanded the ability to freely manipulate the performers turned characters and run perfectly a playhouse positioned in that margin between reality and fiction. Needless to say, Kaori was the star actress in the Iraqi troupe, end quote. In his concluding, concluding thoughts, Izawa rehashes the orthodoxy of those who feel inconvenienced by having to reevaluate their own personal, economic, and moral investments. He hopes that these allegations will not deprive audiences of the future experience of Iraqi's photography. Quote, it would be a dreadful shame to kill off Iraqi completely, he writes, referencing him not as an individual, but as a brand, oddly calling back once again to the idea that there is nothing definitive one could say about Iraqi's culpability or motivations in the face of such a powerful and masterful actor. In this lecture, we briefly learned about Araki Nobuyoshi's career as one of the most controversial and popular male Japanese photographers of the 20th century. And I outlined to you the very specific challenges of curating a retrospective exhibition of his work in a sex positive but for-profit museum institution during the height of the Me Too moment, when allegations against Araki were made public 
many for the first time. Ideally, you can see now how complex the varied networks of interests were at different stages of the exhibition planning and execution, and how at times it seemed extremely difficult to center the experiences of the women whose bodies and faces were so frequently the subjects of the photographs on display. Consider the multiple forces at work that went into creating Araki's celebrity over the course of his long career. The various economic, artistic, and institutional interests are a complicated knot, but it's clear that the very few of those interests were invested in considering what the role of consent was in Araki's photographs. Much of the controversy and debate surrounding Iraqi's photography was centered on the reception of the images. That is, are they pornographic or not? That is, do they sexually excite the viewer? Are they degrading to women or not? That is, is it degrading to women to consume these images, etc.? And with the exception of the feminist scholar Hagiwara Hiroko, critics and curators have largely failed to ask what the conditions of the image's creation and circulation might say about consent, power, and gender in relationship to photography. As Hagiwara writes, for decades, the narrative around Iraqi was always that his models were in full and complete consent, but that, quote, the viewer is not encouraged to question what makes the model consent. The repeated insistence on the model's consent indicates female pleasure in submission. The areas in which women are allowed to participate are circumscribed, end quote. So please take these broad parting questions with you as this lecture concludes. How should museums address the work of male photographers and artists largely who have been alleged or proven to have committed sexual assault, abuse, or other forms of mistreatment? Do you think the best curatorial practice is to ignore the allegations in favor of the art historical value of the works? Is it to recontextualize the works with education programming and chat labels? Or is it to admit the work and the artist entirely? Or is there another alternative practice you can imagine? And what might that look like to you? Thank you.